As with the Terminator movies, you may remember a digitally enhanced Arnold Schwarzenegger endlessly fighting superior robots from the future. Before looking at what the future may hold, whether it is apocalyptic or different, but nonetheless amazing, or somewhere in between, we need to indulge in a short nostalgic view of the lost world that is slipping rapidly out of view. Indeed, in accordance with best Terminator principles, we must take you, my now apprehensive audience, up to the moment before whatever is going to happen actually happens. It is symbolized, ladies and gentlemen, by a piece of pink ribbon, which is an interesting and possibly a rather important artifact in the context of this speech. It would seem that the custom of using a ribbon to hold documents together stretches back at least to the 16th century. Pink ribbon for the defense, white for the prosecution. In the world before the stapler and the lever arch file, it was a convenient way of securing and presenting documents. So it was when I first donned a horsehair wig and a gown made of stuff in 1978. The changes that I have seen during my working life in the way that lawyers and judges and the court staff do their work have been utterly profound. The judges of my generation were all brought up solely on paper. And when I first came to the bar, there was not very much of it because it was before the use of the first office photocopiers. The only option was typing in triplicate on old fashioned typewriters or using a Ronio machine. Some of you may recall all that black ink that ended up on your fingers. The briefs to counsel and the papers held by solicitors were consequently smaller, easily held together by elegant ribbons. And the documents before judges were usually slender piles, a few witness statements, an interview with the accused, and the odd letter or report. Somehow, we survived. Indeed, it feels like a lost paradise. And amazingly, given we are in 2016, many judges still work in exactly the same way, because although much has changed, a great deal has stubbornly remained the same. We have embraced some, a few of the elements of what the new technologies have to offer. But because of a lack of sufficient investment, we have remained rooted in many of the working practices that would be wholly recognizable to judges and court staff from four decades ago, indeed 300 years ago. One of the great changes over the last decade or so is that the pieces of paper have, therefore, simply abandoned. The pink and white ribbons have tended to be replaced by cardboard boxes, albeit the processes, but have remained the same. And it is these traditional ways of working that are about to disappear entirely. The reasons for these changes have been, merry, have been many and varied, but principal among them is the amount of paper with which we now have to wrestle. It has become unmanageable, and the amount of electronic material stored on laptops is unimaginably huge. If you walk around our court estate, as I do nearly daily, it is groaning under the weight of files Acres of rooms are dedicated to them. Mountains of costly nonsense 
as Dickens referred to them in Bleak House. The genesis of the change which is to come was the joint statement by the Lord Chief Justice and the Senior President of Tribunals on the internet in March 2015, when they together with the Lord Chancellor announced a package of investment in the administration of Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service amounting to over 738 million. In fact, when you do all the maths, it's in reality over a billion. Since that announcement, considerable work has been undertaken by certain judges and officials from HMCTS to plan, coordinate, and, and to deliver a um, very ambitious reform program. In reality, it is a clever and bold idea to bring us into the 21st century, to give us a modern system, and to save a substantial sum of money by significant investment. Considerably past time, we will finally catch up with the world in which we renew our driving licenses online, buy microwaves on eBay or novels and music from Amazon and book our holidays online. At the heart of the changes is the idea to design a system for each jurisdiction, a way of working which enables every case to be initiated, progressed and case managed online with all the, with all the papers being served or made available in electronic format. It is so easy to deliver that neat little sentence and it is in danger of slipping by unnoticed. But in truth, it reveals a profound revolution. Com cases will all be done on computer. They will be I unashamedly repeat, managed and progressed online without reference to a single piece of paper. Leastways, that is the clear ambition. Information will only be keyed in once, whether by a police officer in a criminal case or by a legal executive or a litigant in person in other jurisdictions. It will then be passed on in digital format being bundled and stored electronically. In crime, and this it is crucial to, emph to emphasize, will be replicated for civil family and tribunals. The police will send the statements and exhibits to the CPS electronically. The CPS will then serve the papers on the defense and on the court electronically. Appropriate documents will be shared with the court staff, the probation service and the prison authorities, again electronically. One of the leaders in the pack as regards civil family and tribunals is the Social Security and Child Support Tribunal project, which will go first in this process. There will be an identity verification check, online listing and many other features. The aim, therefore, once again in this jurisdiction, is to remove all paper from the operating process. No more couriers, no more lost pieces of paper, no more delays because there is no one to print, photocopy or deliver, or because the ageing equipment is on the blink yet again. In the Rolls Building, where we do, amongst others, all the chancery and commercial work, at the high end. The recently introduced C file enables the parties to launch cases online, pay fees online, cases are managed and listed online. All judges, including magistrates, recorders and other part-timers, have recently moved onto e-judiciary, a new and bespoke Office 365 based system that provides email, our calendars, judicial training, our library, documents, and much else beside, all in one place on the cloud, accessible on any device anywhere in the world. And we are able to share most of these new toys with anyone we choose. 
Having chained myself for quite a long time to the railings outside the Ministry of Justice's headquarters in Petit France, I recently secured new laptops for the judiciary, which are modern, lightweight, touchscreen devices. Magistrates now work from iPads in court, receiving all the documents electronically, and their rotor, their sittings, is now run by an algorithm in the cloud, enabling them to book their sittings online. Hitherto, this had been a painfully laborious process based on multiple telephone calls and many members of staff. Most impressively of all, the entire Crown Court judiciary in the space of 10 months has moved from a paper-based system to an e-paperless court courtesy of what I will unashamedly describe as a simply brilliant system called DCS, the Digital Case System. I recently ran the two-day resident judges conference in Coventry. They are the lead individuals at each Crown Court. And universally, the residents confirmed that every judge trying crime now receives and works with a digital bundle of all the relevant papers in the case laid out in easy to follow folders that enable the judge and the parties to make private notes highlight and copy, communicate with each other from within the system. They now complete the PTPH form. The acronym really means the Plea and Trial Preparation Hearing Form, but recently sentenced defendants lovingly refer to it as the Pressure to Plead Hearing. They complete this in court on their laptops they send out complicated orders from the bench. Many now type their notes in court. And mostly, nearly entirely, they love it. The change has been extraordinary. The ancient and frankly ghastly case management systems in the Crown and Magistrates Court, Libra and Crest, decades old and failing, will soon have stakes put through their hearts by the new kid on the block called Common Platform. And this will ensure that every single element of criminal case management is transferred to the cloud. But this is only the start. And we are fortunate that the start has been touching acres of wood, notably successful. A critical message is that the heart of our planning is that civil family and tribunals will follow soon afterwards, incrementally, and over the next four years. Court users will no longer have to lug sets of papers in the boots of their cars. They will no longer have to wait for them to arrive in the post or via the DX. But instead, all the relevant documents in the case will be accessible via a relevant online portal onto which you will be able to upload any material in the case. The attendant convenience and improved working methods are substantial and self-evident. All of the new systems delivered to date have without, ex without exception experienced some irritating gremlins, but they have each been minor and they have been remediable. At the International Criminal Court, where I was for nine years, I again worked in an entirely paperless environment. Everyone managed extremely well, and that was on an early and very clunky document management system that seems now positively antediluvian. It was not a question of justice suffering because of compromises to enable the court to be digital. Instead, the whole process was greatly enhanced and it created a very efficient and effective level playing field. Someone in the heart of the Democratic Republic of the Congo could access the entirety of the papers in the case so long as they had a laptop and an internet connection. The latter I readily accept 
was in many parts of the Congo a bit of an ask. But we need to get this right. The greatest lesson that has been learned in the early days of this ambitious program is the need to consult. And for us all, IT experts, judges, lawyers, civil servants, those who represent other court users, and including witnesses, we need to build these systems together. The 300-odd common platform team has become reassuringly obsessed about talking to users, and those many individuals consulted thus far have greatly appreciated the experience. Additionally, this moment gives us a chance to rip up the old rule books that have accrued layers of procedural and jurisprudential barnacles and to simplify processes that have turned our procedures into a positive refinement of complication. I am determined that we will conduct far more of our work via video link now the experience of this is far more satisfactory than only a few years ago. The technology is not yet perfect by any means, but it is rapidly improving. I anticipate we are at a but a slender moment away from the time when many court users will never again have to go to a courthouse, but instead from an appropriate location, which may even be their home or office, depending on the case and the circumstances, they will be able to open a laptop or pick up their smartphone at their kitchen table and communicate with the court via Skype or whatever is the most convenient and effective means available. We have huge, densely pixelated screens in every criminal court, soon to be replicated in civil, family, and tribunal buildings that provide a fantastic image of whoever is speaking from a dedicated video room, a mobile video van, or some other quiet location, one that is appropriate for giving evidence. In crime, we have already found that an unexpected amount of pretrial work can be done online and via the telephone. The reaction to this has been overwhelmingly positive and we hope to replicate this underlying approach again in civil family and tribunals, building on the success of existing services like money claims online. There is strong evidence that jurisdictions that do not regularly hold formal hearings have achieved high levels of approval for instance, the Ombudsman Services. We need to ensure that the hearing in court is only held when it is necessary and when it is proportionate for the nature of the dispute. Some processes will be entirely automated. For instance, the Divorce Project will deliver an end-to-end -end digital service for the public or their legal representatives when applying for a divorce dissolution, nullity, or separation. We are currently refining an early prototype of a digital application form, and similar work is underway for obtaining probate online. The judiciary is wedded to the principle of open justice. Greater digitization brings very considerable benefits of the kind I've already outlined, but it also brings risks. A far greater amount of data can now be gathered than hitherto, which can be readily shared because of its electronic nature. But the exam question is how do we make all of this available to the public? Judges will be issuing far more orders straight from their laptops following digital submissions, whether they are the equivalent of email exchanges or by using the telephone or Skype type hearings. Any interested member of the public needs to be provided with access to what has occurred so long as the solutions we create for this requirement are proportionate and effective. Justice must not disappear down an Alice-style rabbit hole 
inaccessible to nearly everyone and bewildering to those who manage to follow that waistcoated, pocket watch holding, impatient creature. I suspect that we will probably opt for viewing centres in local authority and court buildings where members of the public can ask to be shown the content of any hearing that does not play, take place in open court. But these are early days and we are looking for imaginative solutions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that takes us to the point in a Terminator movie at which everything goes horribly wrong. The dystopian future. But then, what is there to go awry in the ambitious yet vanilla and saccharine digital world I have just described? It is surely as innocent as an Enid Blyton story. Well, not quite, or at least we have to be alert. Richard and Daniel Suskind have recently pointed out in their stunning joint book, The Future of the Professions, that machines and systems are becoming increasingly capable, and there is no doubt that over time they will outperform human beings in many tasks. Of course, they already do so. Just to take a few of the interesting examples cited by Suskind, father and son, and relevant by analogy to the role of a modern judge, when algorithms are used in medicine to scan mammograms, this reduces the false negatives for breast cancer by a remarkable 39%, according to a breast clinic in New York. IBM's AI system, known as Watson, is being used to support cancer diagnoses and to recommend treatment plans. The provision of insulin to diabetics is likely to be computer-driven based on sensor data rather than on deliberation and manual intervention by a human being. The University of California at San Francisco has a pharmacy staffed by a single robot which has completed more than two million prescriptions without error. Human error in this context is a significant and regrettable factor. Half of United States doctors use an application known as Hippocrates, a, a digital drug reference resource that computerizes the task of finding out how different drugs interact. This task was once a time-consuming and often inconclusive piece of work, and it has now been rendered highly effective by AI. As it is in medicine, so it is with law. Legal documents are now often produced by tools like Contract Express and Exari, which are able to generate high quality documents after a straightforward consultation with the user. Similar systems aimed specifically at members of the public who do not want to use a lawyer are now becoming available. There are artificial, sophisticated, diagnostic expert systems which tackle highly complex, multi-jurisdictional legal questions and frequently outperform the best specialists. We used to have to go to the library to research whether there were cases that touched on the essay we were writing the submissions we hoped to advance, or the judgment we were about to deliver. Now a quick look at Westlaw or LexisNexis, and every case and commentary in the area is offered up in whatever order you might choose. You trust the algorithm to list all the relevant cases based on your search terms. Indeed, we are grateful for the high degree of accuracy with which the task is carried out. 
Algorithms following an exhaustive analysis of past decisions are able to analyse the likely outcome of cases to a high degree of accuracy. Artificial intelligence methods developed by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, University College London and the University of Sheffield have accurately predicted the results of judicial decisions from the European Court of Human Rights 79% of the time. The method they used was probably the first to forecast the outcome of the out to forecast the outcomes of a major international court by, auto by automatically analyzing case text using a machine learning algorithm. In developing the method, the team extracted case information published in the court's pub publicly accessible database. They then identified data sets for 584 cases relating to Articles 3, 6 and 8 of the Convention. For those three articles for which the most data was available, the scientists applied an algorithm to the text to seek out patterns. Previous studies have predicted outcomes based on the nature of the crime or the policy position of each judge, but this is the first time the results of judgments have been predicted using analysis of text prepared by the court. Of particular interest, given that fairly stunning result, the researchers themselves do not see AI replacing judges or lawyers, but they believe it will be useful for rapidly identifying patterns in cases that lead to particular outcomes. Equally importantly, as the researchers suggest, it could also be a valuable tool for highlighting which cases are most likely to be found to involve violations. This could be extremely important in terms of identifying cases which merit serious consideration. Similarly, big data techniques are underpinning systems that are better than expert litigators in predicting the results of court decisions from patent disputes to the US Supreme Court. Therefore, while the results make a convincing case for the use of machine learning in legal settings as a guide or a prompt or an aid, the researchers do not believe it will mark the end of lawyers and judges. As they indicate, Although AI can make a good guess, without direct appreciation of the wider context outside of its training data and experience, that guess may be widely off the mark, and in a legal situation, that of course can be highly dangerous for the case. On this basis, it seems at some considerable distance from replacing human beings, it will no doubt improve rapidly, thereby providing increased assistance in, in predicting outcomes, and I'm sure we will see a good deal more of this kind of AI tool informing the advice that is provided to would-be litigants and helping judges in their decisions. Moreover, it is, moreover, it is striking that even this development is dependent on analysing decisions made by people and not by machines. It predicts the outcome of our judgments and it does not offer a replacement artificial judgment writing service. You still need the human decisions for the computer program to analyse. But that said, we have opened the door wide to the new technologies and for AI-assisted justice. The reform programme is constructing simple questionnaires that will enable members of the public to answer a series of straightforward questions that, behind the scenes, complete the complicated court forms that are currently required for different stages of the legal process through the courts. 
it follows that part of the fundamental underpinnings of the new online court system is that much of what used to be done or assisted by lawyers, legal executives, members of the court staff, will be progressed by computer programs. Cases will enter the online courts and they will be moved through the system as a result of the information that will be provided, the process known in the business as triage. The litigants will need to identify details such as the nature and value, if known, of the claim, whether there has been an attempt to resolve the issues without resorting to the courts, whether an emergency order is needed, whether the court fees have been paid, whether there has been compliance with the time periods within which claims must be brought or defended, whether the applicant is a vexatious litigant, and on and on. Litigants will be guided through many of the stages, particularly the early stages, by AI, which will also act as a preliminary gatekeeper. This is a complicated and multifaceted process, for different types of cases have different stages, and although there are many underlying similarities between most, if not all, types of cases, the essential elements of the journey are the same, and they share a common corridor, it is necessary to allow for the multifarious distinctions between them. It is to be stressed that providing this guidance through the labyrinth, although a complex exercise, does not involve an exercise of judgment in any substantive sense. The merits of competing arguments are not resolved. Instead, a route is identified depending on the answer to multiple choice questions. I suspect it will feel as if an active intelligence is engaged, weighing and assessing the material and offering more than straight yes or no answers. But of course, the machines are not thinking. Instead, it is reaching its decision by brute number crunching force, to use the words of Garry Kasparov when he was beaten by the chess playing system called Deep Blue in 1997. That machine did not think and play like a human being with human creativity and intuition, and instead it played like a machine evaluating 200 million possible moves. It might, these systems might outperform us, but they will do so in quite inhuman ways. But critically, we are moving rapidly towards the position in which certain cases may never be touched by a human being. For low-level crime, for instance, truly minor traffic offences, we already enable people to plead guilty online without going to court. It is, in my view, almost inevitable that in due course we will allow individuals charged with non-imprisonable minor offences of this kind to accept the option of being sentenced online by an algorithm, thereby avoiding the courthouse. Indeed, no human being would consider the case at all, save for reasons of extraneous interest. AI can easily weigh the essential characteristics of the offence, for instance, 15 miles per hour over the speed limit, against any other relevant information, such as disposable income after, assen after essential bills, and arrive at an appropriate formulaic outcome. In reality, that is what magistrates up and down the land do every day. We would, of course, leave open the, the, the real option that an individual defendant or the prosecution may want some particular factor or piece of mitigation to be taken into account whereon the case would be transferred into open court. 
But again, it needs to be stressed that this process would not involve the exercise of anything we would recognise as judgement. Instead, it is the application of a formula. I touched fleetingly on some of these issues by way of an attempted joke to the Bon Solon Expert Witnesses Conference last Friday. In what was clearly a failed stab at humour, I said at the end of my speech as follows, one last thought, perhaps all of us professionals who rather enjoy our jobs need to hope that the new digital systems, those clever algorithms, do not render us entirely redundant. We may ultimately be fighting the rise of the robotic court, close quotes. It was meant as a concluding, utterly unserious light aside. This was solemnly reported in one major broadsheet a day or two later as online, just, online justice could put judges out of business in the wake of the march of the robotic court, says top judge. I vowed when I read that never again to attempt humour in speeches, hence my solemn tone this evening. The risk of being misunderstood is simply too great. Therefore, for the benefit of any reporters in the audience, or indeed any nervous members of the judiciary, there will be no, I repeat, there will be no judicial redundancies as a result of these reforms. It goes without saying that changing work patterns, the overall number of cases in the system at any one time, the enhanced role for case officers performing routine box work under judicial supervision in the future, and improved IT and other factors may well, over the long term, lead to some adjustment in the overall number of judges. But this is simply an extension of something that has always happened. There have ever been variations to the judicial complement depending on a wide variety of factors, and we will continue to look with great care at the exact number of judges that are needed in the light of changed circumstances. These are adjustments that are made on a careful and continuing basis by the complement group which advises the Lord Chief Justice and the Lord Chancellor. But a critical secondary question then arises. Will the new online system, those clever algorithms, eventually replace the judicial role? Given the many and varied improvements yet to come, will software take over from human judgment? The answer again, based on everything of which we are presently aware, is a further resounding no. Notwithstanding all this digitization and code writing, even allowing for all of the phantasmagorical advances in technology, every decision about substantive rights will be made by a judge and the main elements of conciliation will be conducted by a human being. The court may well be assisted by some ingenious tools of the kind I have described earlier in this speech and judicially supervised case officers may undertake certain routine tasks in the case as has happened since time out of mind in the magistrates' courts, for instance, by justices' clerks. But the substantive decisions will remain firmly in the hands of properly qualified people. Now, of course, in a galaxy far, far away, things may be so unutterably changed and different that computer programs might one day be entrusted to run everything, with Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia spending their time improving their handicaps on fabulous interstellar golf courses. But I'm talking about now, 
and a future we can sensibly foresee now. And in that world, justice is dispensed by human beings, whether they are magistrates, judges or jurors. I have no doubt that we would only contemplate handing over that critical role if human beings had totally abandoned running their own affairs and humanity had assigned the executive, the legislature and the civil service over to the machines. Artificial intelligence does not enjoy thoughts or emotions, even though IBM's Watson computer may have won the TV quiz show Jeopardy in 2011. And I do not anticipate that any of us would welcome Watson deciding whether to take children into care, whether somebody was not guilty of murder by reason of diminished responsibility or on the grounds of provocation, or whether one oligarch promised another on a yacht in the Mediterranean that he would inherit the riches of Croesus. As the Suskins suggest in their book, and I quote, we tend to want another human being to have reflected, perhaps agonized over decisions and advice that matters to us. Somehow, in some circumstances, it feels inappropriate or wrong to abnegate responsibility and pass it along to a machine, no matter how high performing. Technology is advancing at an astonishing pace but I have a high degree of confidence that we will jealously guard human control over human affairs and most particularly the administration of justice. The title of this speech was then, was then in the end, no more than a snare and a delusion. I do not believe in a true cyber judge. It is the stuff of science fiction and alarmist headlines. But I do believe, passionately, in the assistance that IT and AI can provide in the discharge of our judicial function. These machines and cloud-based technologies offer truly tremendous opportunities, which we have been given a once-in-a-generation opportunity to seize, and the judiciary is participating fully and enthusiastically in the process of reform so as to ensure that the new systems are sensibly devised and most particularly that they greatly enhance the ability of the public to access justice with or without the assistance of lawyers. We are determined that the new software will provide easy to navigate online portals that will enable anyone in this country or indeed from abroad to progress their cases without having to decipher impenetrable rules written in arcane language or to follow Byzantine procedures. We seek to demystify and reduce the stages in the process of litigation to the bare, easy to follow and necessary essentials. That is the true revolution that is currently underway. Not the rise of the robots of science fiction, but developing a wide range of technologies in order to improve, no, that is too modest, to utterly transform our practices, processes, and procedures, thereby making justice efficient, available, and cost-effective. In other words, fit for the 21st century. It follows that this judge does not predict the imminent creation of Victor Frankenstein's grotesque, sapient creature, Instead, I find guidance in Giuseppe Lampedusa's great novel, The Leopard, in which the principal character, the Prince of Selina, explained his accommodation with the new order in Italy following the departure of the Bourbon kings during the Risorgimento, in a wonderful expression of world-weary patrician cynicism. He suggested that everything must change so that everything can stay the same. I would utter a different but allied sentiment. We must change root and branch in order to preserve all the essential elements 
of our excellent system of justice, a system which is, of course, run by and on behalf of human beings. Thank you all very much.